Building designers can achieve big reductions in embodied carbon. Join Corporate Responsibility Officer Amy Hatton as she talks with technical experts about ways to reduce the negative impact of buildings on climate change. Here's how Embodied Carbon is a production of Thornton Tomasetti. Hi, and welcome to episode four of Here's How Embodied Carbon. This series explores how engineers and designers can reduce embodied carbon, which is the emissions from the manufacture, transportation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of building materials and minimize the negative impacts of buildings and other structures on climate change. I'm Amy Hatton, Thornton Tomasetti's Corporate Responsibility Officer. We're an international multidisciplinary engineering and consulting firm committed to channeling all of our capabilities to tackle climate change. And we've been focused on embodied carbon for over a decade. I'm talking with technical experts from across the company about the paths they are taking to achieve the greatest reductions in greenhouse gas emissions on their projects. Today, I'm talking with my colleague, Julie Petrak, Resilience Practice Leader, about how resilient thinking during design can reduce embodied carbon in the built environment. Hi, Julie. Hi, Amy. I'm happy to be here. Let's jump right in. Julie, resilience and emissions reductions are often seen as two different aspects of climate action. How can one support the other? First, we're in a state of a climate emergency, and the only way to avoid devastating consequences is to act now to reduce carbon in every way we can, and that includes designing for resilience. Resilience is about preparing for and adapting to changing conditions. It's about being able to bounce back quickly after a disruption. But resilience strategies can also yield embodied carbon reductions. Here's an example from an athletic facility that's located at the confluence of two rivers. So the focus was on creating flood resilience. But we also set a goal of cutting embodied carbon by 10%. The site is in a FEMA-designated 100-year floodplain with a design elevation of 11 feet. But projections for sea level rise for 2080 increase that to 13.3 feet. So that's where we put the finished floor of the building. Then we added both wet and dry floodproofing measures. Wet floodproofing? That means you let water in, right? Why would you want to do that? Yes, exactly. You install flood openings and damage-resistant finishes and let water flow freely in and out during a flood. It's a great passive option. With the right materials and finishes, it's going to be relatively easy to clean up afterwards. And it lets you lower the embodied carbon in the building by a lot. How? With dry flood proofing, you keep out water entirely. You need a foundation slab that's thick enough to resist the enormous pressure flood water and debris can exert. Those pressures extend to the perimeter walls as well. And you need flood barriers that add another level of complexity because there has to be somebody who knows how to operate and maintain them. As I said earlier, we put the first finished floor higher than code requires. So if flooding reaches the past high water mark, which was 9.5 feet, the water wouldn't come close to getting in. But flood events are getting worse. To deal with this in a practical and sustainable way, we designed flood vents that allow the automatic flow of water in and out. That lets you have a thinner slab and thinner walls. It uses less material because you don't have to counteract the hydrodynamic, hydrostatic, and debris loads that are required for dry floodproofing. At this building, they were initially looking at a 12-inch slab on grade, but the decision to go with wet floodproofing meant that thickness could be cut nearly in half 
Concrete has high embodied carbon, so this change provided a significant reduction. Wet flood proofing sounds like a really effective decision. Are there any other benefits to this strategy? Absolutely. Because the design doesn't only save on embodied carbon during construction, there's also the future savings you get from starting with durable materials. The interior finish materials were selected for being able to withstand a flood event. Polished concrete instead of rubber flooring, for example, and exposed CMU instead of gypsum wallboard. They aren't going to mold or warp if they get wet. We calculated the embodied carbon saved by not having to replace them. We also worked with the client and the design team to put the building's critical MEP services on a higher floor so it won't be damaged during a flood. So that saves the carbon associated with replacing that equipment. So what was the bottom line? Well, Amy, our goal was to reduce the building's embodied carbon by 10%. But just by making this one decision about wet flood proofing, we were able to save 26%. 26%. This is how resilient thinking is actively combating climate change. Wow, that's exciting. Thank you, Julie, for sharing your expertise with us today. Folks, there's more. Follow Thornton Tomasetti for more episodes of Here's How Embodied Carbon.